Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrease, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today, we'll be talking remotely with Dr. William Seeds. Dr. Seeds is an orthopedic surgeon who practices orthopedics in Ashtabula, Ohio. Dr. Seeds is also the medical director for the Great Center in Geneva, Ohio. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Seeds. Thank you for having me, Randy. I'm excited to be here today. Dr. Seeds, what I thought we would discuss today is, is, is a very common problem amongst athletes that are involved in contact sports, and that's head and neck injuries. I think as we're starting to see in the news today, uh, this has become more of a problem as we're seeing our football players especially using techniques where the helmet is used as, as somewhat of a, uh, a device to, to do some type of aggressive uh, mo motion on the field that is either a block or a tackle or something like that that puts the, the, the athlete at risk for a head injury or a neck injury. I think we can also see this in some of the other lesser contact sports like soccer and rugby, but it, it's become a real problem in football. What I'd like to discuss today with you is, is in your role as a sports medicine physician on the field, when you see these injuries occur at the time, We've got several different questions. One is, is you know, what, what, what's going on with the athlete? What's the injury like? Two is how do you assess the athlete and, and determine whether they can go back into the game? Because all these athletes, once they wake up from these problems, they, they want to go back into the sport, and it may or may not be safe for them to do that. So I guess the other piece is how you counsel these athletes, coaches and parents, uh, in these younger athletes about the risk and the benefits of going back in. So start by sort of giving us the scope of the problem. What are you seeing as you uh, are on the sidelines, especially in football games? How, how big a problem is this? Well, Randy, I think this is an excellent topic in lieu of all of the information that's coming out right now in the NFL about how they're trying to improve uh, the control of uh, head injuries. Uh, specifically in football. And uh, I will tell you that we're definitely seeing an, a, an increase in the number of injuries, uh, head injuries that we're able to identify at this time. I think a lot of it is due to we're doing a better job of educating um, the players, the families, and the coaches. And so we're, I think as a group, we're, we're better at, at trying to identify these, these, these problems. And I, I think with concussions, um, it, there, are, there are also some, some I, I think we have to understand with concussions, there, there are some controversies over is it a concussion, is it a traumatic brain injury? Um, I think there's some play on words, but basically we're looking at, at, at brain injuries. And, and I think that's what we have, to, we have to all agree on, that there is an injury to the head that that is causing an injury to the brain. And we all need to know that this can have long-term effects on these individuals within a few years or down 10, 20 to 30 years down the road. So knowing this, I think it's important that we also realize that on the field, you have to be very attuned to what's happened um, at possibly at the time of injury, because I'll tell you that a lot of the players, you know, when they come off the field, they're not going to tell you they got hurt. They're not going to tell you that they, that maybe they might have had some type of injury to their head. They're going to get up, they're going to come off the field, or they're going to get back in the huddle. And I think we, we're still missing possibly up to maybe a third of those injuries. So you, you've got to be attuned to watching the player and, and trying to identify those problems initially uh, in, in helping these, these players with these injuries. Now, when, when you see a player come off the field who's had a head injury, who may, may have had a brief loss of consciousness, maybe even not, um, what are you doing to assess that patient? What sort of questions are you asking the patient to get uh, some idea of how serious this is? Well, I, I'm defining with, with my trainers and and what we try to educate the, uh, the coaches and so forth with is that loss of consciousness doesn't essentially mean that they've, that they've blacked out. It could be as much as an injury to the head where we're looking for the, the player coming off the field and having a sense of um, immediate fatigue, 
uh, a fogging of, of what they may feel is, is um, they're, they're kind of living in a fog, um, problems with vision as far as light sensitive or even sound sensitive, uh, nausea type of symptoms, lightheadedness, dizziness, and I, I think dizziness is, the, is probably the, the, the initial thing I hear the most. Doc, I, I feel a little dizzy. And those are things that you need to start, when you hear that, then you need to start looking a little bit further and questioning that, that patient. Uh, what is their speech pattern like? Are they able to, to focus their attention on what you're saying? And if I see any of those symptoms, that's it for the game. I mean, to me, at that point in time, they've had some type of injury that's affected their brain. And until those symptoms resolve, and, and you follow those symptoms for over a 24-hour period and, and so forth, you, you, you've got to be responsible and that, that player's got to come out of the game. Well, I think we ought to explain for parents and coaches and even uh, players what, what constitutes a head injury. I think you've mentioned some of the symptoms you see, but I think there's a, a misperception out there that if you, if you didn't lose consciousness, you didn't have a concussion or you didn't have a brain injury. Um, clarify that for me. Is that true? Randy, that's absolutely true and I think that's where we've, we've run into problems in the past and I think the NFL is, has really come to, to the table also identifying that, hey, a concussion is not just a loss of consciousness. Before we used to, we used to kind of blow off any of those symptoms. If, uh, if that patient didn't lose consciousness where they blacked out for a few seconds or a few minutes, then they were okay to continue to play. That, that's not true. If a player is having some aspects of what I just discussed, you know, altered consciousness as far as lightheadedness, fogginess, blurred uh, vision, um, slurred speech, uh, inattentive, unable to, to uh, follow commands well, uh, dizziness, um, not off balance, you know, you can do some initial balance testing and I mean you can hone in on these things very quickly, you, you can't hide them. And I think we're very attentive to those, uh, to those aspects now and, and I'll tell you on the flip side, now that the players know we're looking for it, I, I think some of them are, are definitely hiding those symptoms or, or trying to stay away because they don't want to be taken out of the game. Now in terms of the brain injury that, that occurs with a concussion, what do you think is going on with the brain? Can you explain that so that patients and coaches and, 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 and parents uh, can understand what's actually going on in the brain? Sure, Randy. Well, we, we've actually, um, there have been studies that, that have, have looked at the, you know, what potentially could be occurring in the brain um, where they've done uh, studies such as uh, functional MRI evaluations of the brain after acute injuries and they've been able to show that there are certain areas in the brain that are definitely affected by the the trauma and uh, that can have that that trauma um, to the brain can show up as um, subtle changes on the MRI suggesting that there were alterations in in blood flow to a certain area of the brain that that can have long-term effects uh, on that brain um, as, as we age. Um, so I think, and there's a lot of exciting data that's coming out now where we're, we're doing more to follow these patients and, and look at these type of injuries, but there is, there is absolutely evidence that there are alterations in, um, in what we see functionally on an MRI and also uh, physically as far as impairment to the brain. Well, in terms of treatment, I mean, you've mentioned that if you see a, an athlete come out of the game with any of these symptoms, that you're going to take them out of the game at that point. Um, what else do you uh, advise those patients to do in terms of treatment? What are they going to do the next day? Well, it, it, it's very important to continue to do a neurological assessment and, and get an idea of, of how this patient is progressing with this injury. And uh, it's very important to educate the family that you want to do a neuro, a, a neuro assessment. Uh, what, what we try to do is, is follow that patient every couple hours um, initially, and it depends on the severity of the symptoms again, um, and, and 
kind of make sure or we want to make sure that those symptoms do um, do stop and that there is some improvement uh, within that 24 hours if, if it goes beyond that 24 hours then then we'll do some uh, more of a intense observation uh, some of these patients we may admit uh, in, to the hospital to follow it just depends again on the severity of the symptoms and and some of these patients with with um, mild concussions can have symptoms that can last weeks um, and those symptoms could just be dizziness or lightheadedness and and the problem is is that if you let players play with any of these symptoms we're doing harm to that brain the brain is not the, the brain is very fragile and will not if if they're playing with any of these symptoms all we're doing is making that situation worse for them well and it seems like we're also putting them at risk because if uh, some of the symptoms that you just suggested you know balance problems inability to think quickly actually puts them at risk of another injury um, of the same sort if they're not playing up to a hundred percent you know it's just like when you get tired you're more likely to be injured Obviously, if, you're, if you've lost some of your cognitive abilities or some of your balance, you're more likely to be injured, whether it's a brain injury or some other injury, I would assume. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, a absolutely, Randy. And, and I, I think it's important also to understand that we've seen some new studies that have come out recently where they've actually been able to track high school football players. And uh, they've put they've put sensors in the helmets and they've actually been able to follow a group of, of football players, football players that have had mild concussions, football players that, that were supposed to be normal with no, no brain injury at all, um, where they followed all these players with, with the sensors, they followed them with functional MRIs, they followed them with neuro in, um, cognitive type of testing, and they, they found some very interesting um, aspects of this study where it showed that that continued head trauma um, where there are no symptoms or sequelae uh, of injury where someone's had a continued injury to the head or or continued let's say tackling with the head um, that those people have the same functional change can have the same functional changes on the MRI and the neuro impair, uh, cognitive testing they can show impairment just the same as the concussive patients. And, and that's pretty alarming because those are people that, you know, th that they show no signs of concussion or symptoms, but in retrospect at looking, you know, looking back at these players, they found that these players had an increased amount of head contact. And uh, that, that's very concerning because we know that we've seen this what, what we would call a traumatic neuroencephalopathy of these NFL players that, you know, in their 50s and 60, 60s that are developing these symptoms of, of, of impairment with uh, the use of their brain. And so I, I think that all of this information is, uh, is all, is very important in what we're trying to do to help these players continue to play the sport, but be very, very concerned about what's, what's happening. You know, as you're, as you're beginning to watch these patients uh, two, three days down the road and maybe they're still having symptoms, when do you make the decision that it's time to do some sort of imaging, like uh, an MRI scan of the head or a CAT scan of the head? Uh, when is that? Um, uh, Randy, I, I have a, uh, my rule is, is pretty much, it, it's a very, uh, I, I don't know if you call it aggressive, but it's, it, it's a, it's a rule of I, I would say 24 hours of where I if I have players that continue to have symptoms within a 24-hour period um, I, I don't hesitate to to uh, move forward with the CT and uh, further testing of the uh, of the brain and, and I think it's you know there's a lot of relevance to that with the concern of the parents and um, not sometimes not seeing the injury at the time it, it occurred I mean there's a lot of things that that really sometimes can fog that presentation where you don't you do not want to be caught um, from behind with with not properly assessing this and so within 24 hours if if these patients are having uh, continued symptoms um, will will move forward with that now if I have patients that have immediate a loss of consciousness on the field um, uh, then there are times that we will immediately do a CT um, 
that same night. So it just really, again, depends on the presentation. And I think we're very aggressive with it, but I think you need to be. Well, and what about treatment? I mean, other than just watching the patient and making sure that the situation isn't getting worse and maybe there's no bleeding into the, into the skull or something like that or no skull fracture that needs to be addressed, is there really any treatment that you can provide to patients who've had a concussion and may be exhibiting some of these symptoms over a period of several days? Anything active that you do to try to, to, to help that situation to resolve? Yeah, I, I think that education is, is absolutely the best thing you can do with the family and the individual. Um, I have found that, and we found in, in our experience that there, I would say the number one complaint or or question that that has come up in the past is that the family or the players notice they notice a change in their behavior uh, they're more irritable um, they may even show some depressive signs or symptoms that they don't even know are depression and um, and these things can happen right away and, and it's very it's very disturbing where I'd say in the past maybe people weren't aware of these things or they weren't educated about looking at these things and and just those those behavioral things can make a big difference in how the family uh, approaches this and the players understanding that hey there are some things that can occur here that uh, that can be very relevant um, the other things are you know we we try to um, we try to help them with the visual and sound cues as far as you know uh, maybe being more in a rested area where they're not getting a lot of uh, a lot of um, other uh, a lot of environmental uh, things that can affect it you know bright lights and sounds and things like that uh, again it depends on the symptoms and um, so those those are some of the early initial things we'll do but but no medications that you're you're uh, recommending or anything any sort of special diets or anything that the patient should be actively doing other than than the thing the behavioral things you're talking about. No, not in the not in the acute onset. Um, we do try to we do try to limit you know their appetite somewhat, but most of them aren't hungry when these things occur. Um, so no, there aren't any. We don't tell them to take aspirin. We don't tell them to take a Tylenol or anything like that because. I want to know what these symptoms are. I don't want to mask them. I want to know if they're having headaches, if they're having these complaints. And um, I, I, I forgot to mention, you know, headache, along with dizziness, headaches are the other thing um, that, are, that are very relevant and significant. And the headache tends to show up a little bit later. It's not an initial complaint. It goes dizziness and then headache is the, is the thing that the patient will complain of down the road. Well, you know, it, it seems like that, that prevention is, is is part of the key to this. I mean, I think that when you're playing football, you're doing some of these things, you just simply can't avoid the possibility of a head injury. But it seems to me that, that clearly the discussion today is, is that we're putting our athletes at risk because they're specifically doing things that, that increase the risk of a head, in, head injury. So how do you work with the, the athletes in a preventative way to try to teach them skills that reduce their risk of head injury? Well, I, I think that is a continuing uh, educational process that's happening right now, um, not only in high school and collegiate athletes, but also in the NFL. I mean, we're trying to change now the, you know, back uh, uh, striking with the head uh, as far as direct contact changed many years ago. Now we're trying to change the zone and where you can strike. Um, we're trying to show the proper techniques, and and it, and it's it's still interesting to me today to see that the uh, the techniques of tackling of where some some people aren't properly educated on on the aspects of tackling and and the appropriate um, approach, uh, which now you can now the the NFL is is producing videos on just that, on the proper technique, the strike zone. Um, all these things, I think, play an important role in that. Let's talk for a moment about the athlete that's had a head injury and the risk of additional head injuries down the road and, and sort of how you advise that athlete. If you have an athlete, a young athlete, with a significant head injury, what do you tell them about their sport? I mean, do you tell them not to go back to the sport? What kind of risk are they taking when they go back to the sport? Those sorts of issues. Well, I think it's important now with the information that we 
that we are are, are gathering more of um, specifically with these these type of injuries uh, we're aware now that there are long-term problems uh, with just a single concussion so it's very important to educate these families that there there can be reperca repercussions with this this brain injury and and um, my rule of thumb is if if a player has had a second concussion um, I usually recommend that 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 they need to seriously consider not participating in that sport again because we know that multiple brain injuries such as this uh, uh, can can absolutely have a long-term effect and, and again our, our role is to educate and to let these people know that hey we're, we're trying to we're trying to improve your your quality of life as you age so it, I'm, I'm not a I'm a realist in, in giving the family and the players that information and I will I'm I'm very stringent on the on those type of uh, problems as far as if a players had a second concussion um, they need to seriously consider what they're doing and, and I won't clear them to play if if they're able to you know have further opinions and recommendations I'll certainly look at that uh, but that's kind of my stance I take you know on the lower level of uh, high school and, and collegiate athletes. Well, I think this has been a, a very good discussion for the young athlete especially, but, but athletes of all ages that are involved in contact sports. Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you feel like that patients or coaches or parents need to know about head injuries and how to, uh, how to manage a head injury once it's occurred? I think the family, what, what we discussed as far as just trying to, just being aware you know, again, it's it's very interesting to me that the the families sometimes the 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 mother or father that are out there in the stands they know something's happened to their child before the coach or or the physician knows because they know what their kid typically is doing out there. They know that the kid usually sprints or he's hustling or he's doing. They, they can recognize problems right away, and I encourage the families to come to us, come to the trainer, and say, "Hey, something's just not right with my kid. I, I don't know what it is, but um, those kinds of things can really help in in getting that player the proper attention." And and I have found that to be invaluable with uh, with evaluating and, and treating these kids earlier. Well, I want to thank you for this information, and and I want to invite uh, uh, parents, players, and uh, coaches. Uh, to continue watching a second segment where you and I are going to discuss a little different topic, but something that's very close to this, and that's neck injuries in contact sports. You know, it goes by different names, sometimes burners, stingers, or uh, sometimes just, just injury to the neck, but it's uh, another problem that we're seeing in conjunction with the head injury. So thanks for this discussion, and, and I, I would invite uh, uh, the, the the viewers now to, to find the second video on the neck injuries because I think that's very complimentary what we just discussed. So thanks again for the information. Thank you, Randy.